Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Omar Bay, and this is the Physicians Health Network. All right. We are a group of African-American physicians that have two main purposes out here. Number one uh, is to improve health in the African-American community. Number two is to let young Black males know that they can become doctors, that there's really nothing special about us. We are, you know, African-Americans. Our goal was to become physicians, and as well, they can become physicians as well. So that's our goal. Understand that we are here on the web, in the webinar, every second Saturday at one o'clock. And we wish that each and every one would continue to join us. Tell friends, tell family, tell church members. Remember, it takes a village for all of us to be healthy. Okay. Uh, if you have missed any of our webinars, they are on YouTube and you go to OB Healthy. That's the letter O, that's the letter B and healthy. And you can see all of our past videos. Remember to su subscribe because that way we can continue to offer our videos on YouTube. All right. Most important is do not change any aspect of your medical care until you consult your physician, no matter what we say. Only your doctor can truly best take care of you from a physician and a patient perspective. So please do not change any aspect of your medical care until you consult your physician. All right. You know what I'd like to do next? I would like to introduce our physicians and I'll let them introduce themselves. I'm going to follow the order that's on my screen. All right. But first I'd like to let you know that we do have a special specialty today and it is ear, nose and throat. And, ear, and if you have a problem with your ears, your nose, your throat, meaning if uh, you're having uh, dizziness or if you're having the sore throat or hoarseness or any problem with ear, nose, and throat, today is to get your question answered. All righty. So let's start with Dr. Court. Dr. James Court, could you please introduce yourself? My name is Dr. James Court. My practice is internal medicine. My office is located in East Orange General Hospital, East Orange in East Orange, New Jersey. All righty, okay. And next we will have Dr. Dr. Uh, Wallace, you're, uh, you're still on mute. Thank yes, you. I, uh, good afternoon, I'm Dr. Wallace, uh, Derek Wallace. Uh, my practice, I practice ear, nose and throat, general ENT. My office uh, is in Nutley and soon to be in Montclair uh, sometime um, over the summer. Excellent, excellent. Dr. Salam, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Dr. Kareem Salam, uh, board certified adult and child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I practice in the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection, Philadelphia. Glad All to right. be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Atherley. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Trevor Atherley. I'm a cardiologist. Uh, specialized in interventional aspects of cardiology. I am based in Newark, uh, out of Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. Thank you. All righty, excellent. And the next will be Dr. Nelson Aluya. Well, good afternoon once again, um, people uh, back home, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be amongst this great and uh, very noble gentleman of physicians. Um, and Nelson Aluya, uh, Medicine Pediatric Strange, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Newark Beth Israel, at uh, the New Jersey Medical School at uh, Newark, and also an attending at uh, Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. It's a pleasure to be here. All righty. And Dr. Dwayne Fredericks. Hey, good morning. Well, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Dwayne Fredericks. I'm a bariatric surgeon. I, that means I, I do surgery for weight management. But for people who don't do, want to have surgery, I also do medical management for uh, obesity. And my office is in South Orange. All Make right, excellent. We will have other doctors joining us as uh, the program goes on. All righty. So what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to start with the first question. We do have a couple questions that have come up. Uh, one question uh, uh, 
And this is a question that's often asked, actually. Um, what, if anything, can be done about uh, tinnitus or ringing in the ears? All right, <laughs> and, and that, that's, that's an excellent question to start off with. Dr. Wallace, can you help us out a little bit? All right, so tinnitus affects millions of people uh, throughout the world. Uh, it's actually quite common. Um, it's common for most people to experience what we call intermittent tinnitus or tinnitus that happens from time to time. Uh, you're, it's a, you're in a quiet environment, you're going to bed, you hear a noise, you're wondering what that sound is, and, 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 and that's very common. What tends to bother most people is constant tinnitus that does not go away, um, doesn't vary, um, and sometimes can be quite intense. And unfortunately, we do not have any, certainly no um, medications that, that we can give to, to treat tinnitus. Um, you'll see a lot of things over the counter, eardrops, different vitamins. There, there are those, those um, those items are not effective. Uh, there have been no clinical studies, clinical trials to show efficacy, um, uh, vitamins, eardrops, um, or any medications to treat uh, tinnitus. Uh, if you're experiencing tinnitus for the first time, certainly if it's uh, acute onset, then you should get in to see uh, an otolaryngologist, ear, nose, and throat physician have a physical exam, and more, and most importantly, have a hearing test because the most common thing associated with tinnitus is hearing loss. And certainly, if it's sudden onset, uh, that needs to be addressed immediately because if you have uh, a drop in your hearing that's associated with that tinnitus, that can be treated and potentially uh, that can be reversed. Uh, however, tinnitus a lot of times is associated with people who have um, uh, long-term uh, noise exposure. So, you know, loud music, headphones, people who work in construction over time, that constant exposure to loud sounds can cause high frequency sensory neural hearing loss, and that can lead to tinnitus over time. Um, so when I say there's no medical therapy, there's no medications for it, there are things such as tinnitus maskers, these are hearing aid like uh, devices that you wear that basically provide a sound to help drown out the noise that you are hearing in your head. Also, if you have hearing loss associated with tinnitus, the actual presence of a hearing aid, which will amplify background sound, can also help to treat the tinnitus. Uh, things that you do at, and at nighttime and when you're trying to get to bed and go to sleep and you hear the sound, basically using what's called a white noise maker, trying to distract your mind from the actual sound that you're hearing, that's one of the best forms of, of treatment for it. Uh, for some people, it creates a lot of anxiety, so getting the anxiety treated, taking anxiolytics or anti-anxiety medications can help as well. Oh, excellent, excellent, excellent answer. Uh, we have uh, one of our physicians that have joined us, Dr. Patrick Anderson. Uh, can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, I'm Dr. Anderson. I'm a gynecologic oncologist, I'm chief at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center, I work out of the Fred Cohen Cancer Center and in my office in uh, South Orange, New Jersey. Glad excellent. to be Yeah, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Let's go on with some more questions. Right, on. I have yes. one question for the, for the doctor before you go. Oh, what, yes, definitely. Lots of questions. Dr. Wallace, <laughs> what, what, is yes. a, what is a white noise maker? Uh, so it's a machine that basically produces a sound, kind of like a seashell type noise. There are also apps, I believe, now uh, available uh, through the various uh, platforms that also will provide certain sounds. I, I tell people usually I think the radio. Froze. So what's that? Um, uh, no, Dr. Salam, I think he would, from my standpoint, uh, I okay. could hear him, Dr. Salam. Okay. Uh, I also tell people to, so uh, those of us of a certain age, you know, we still, we still have radios or in the house, you know, put a radio on, put it in between so you get a little static noise. So anything that produces a, a low frequency sound uh, will, will help with the tinnitus. Excellent. Any more questions? Yeah, Dr. Salam, what about like people try to put things in their ears? Would that, would that help? No, actually, sometimes that'll intensify the sound. So I've had people come in with impacted cerumen or they, they have a, a, a flu, um, fluid in the ear, what we call a serous effusion, and that'll present with tinnitus as well. And, and if you remove the impacted cerumen or uh, remove the fluid, the, the sound will dissipate. So usually plugging the ear doesn't help. Okay, excellent. 
There was another question that came in, and we, it's good that they're ENT questions. How to safely remove impacted earwax? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, do not do it on your own. Okay. Um, actually, I just saw a gentleman in the office on Tuesday. Uh, he was trying to clean out his ear. It was his wedding day. He put the Q-tip in the ear. He was coming out of the shower. He, the way he describes it, he put the wet towel on top of his head and jammed the Q-tip into his ear. He perforated his eardrum and lost some of his hearing. Uh, you know, fortunately for him, it's a small perforation and will likely heal and he didn't do any permanent damage to his ear. So definitely do not go sticking Q-tips, bobby pins, uh, pen caps and other things into your ear to try to clear out the packets from it. Uh, the best thing to do is to use uh, over-the-counter wax softening drops. Uh, they make kits that you can try to irrigate your ear out with. That's the safest way for the lay person. Uh, I had a patient come in recently uh, touting a, a camera device that they're uh, with a scoop that you put in the ear. I mean, none of these, I can't even clean out my own ears. So, you know, no. I, I don't think there's a safe way for anyone to do it. I do not recommend putting any type of instrumentation into your own ear. Uh, I, I, see, I see so many injuries uh, from that. So the best, the best thing to do is to try the drops, you know, your ear will clog temporarily and then eventually come out. And if it doesn't, then you have to go see your primary care or an EMT and we can clear the wax for you. And then sometimes it's not wax. So a few, I would say maybe about seven years ago now, seven to 10 years ago, my ear clogged. I thought it was wax. Of course, I can't see into my own ear. I had the audiologist look and what I thought was wax turned out to be a, uh, an effusion, a fluid. Uh, and, and so a lot of times you're trying to clean out your ear, you have no idea what's going on and you can't see, and it may be wax or it may be some other pathology. Excellent, excellent. Let me ask, let me ask a question, please. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Wallace, um, huh? are there other diseases um, that can cause meaning metabolic disease or inflammatory disease that can cause tinnitus or medications as well? The medication, yeah, that's a good question. So um, tinnitus can be associated with excessive uh, use of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory such as aspirin, Aleve, uh, Excedrin. So people who are taking it for various inflammatory problems can it can either intensify or, or tinnitus can develop. Uh, and it's usually reversible when it's when, when those are the causes. Um, you know, I've had patients with Lyme disease who develop sensory neural hearing loss who develop tinnitus. Um, syphilis, we don't see much anymore, but that's one of the things that we will work up uh, as well. Um, very rarely, you know, I don't wanna be an alarmist, but sometimes unilateral tinnitus can be caused by small uh, nerve sheath tumors what we call acoustic neuromas. Um, and, and so if we see a patient who has unilateral tinnitus and hearing loss, we'll, we'll get an MRI and, and sometimes we'll detect these very small tumors in, in the brain as well. Uh, I have a question. Go My, ahead, Dr. Corey. Doctor, what, what really causes the tinnitus? What's the pathophysiology? So it's, it's believed to be the absence of sound input at certain frequencies that the brain, the brain perceives those, the absence of that sound input as, as a noise. That's the, the theory behind it. Mm. How about Meniere's disease? Uh, Meniere's disease is a whole different thing. So Meniere's disease is, uh, is hearing loss associated with uh, sodium imbalance in the inner ear. And the symptoms of Meniere's disease are clogging of the ear, fluctuating hearing loss, and tinnitus, and sometimes vertigo. So that's what Meniere's disease is. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wallace, if I might ask a question, sir, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Anderson. Sometimes as we, uh, as, not, as we age, um, folks talk about um, shifts in our balance. Um, mm -hmm. Can you explain to us and the audience how that might be a contributing factor, the inner ear can be a contributing factor? So balance issues, unfortunately, very, very complex. Sometimes it's an inner ear issue. A lot of times it has nothing to do with the ears whatsoever. So changes in blood flow uh, to the brain, you know, whether there's narrowing of the, of the uh, uh, carotid uh, blood flow, um, whether it's vision changes, uh, sometimes a hearing imbalance can do it. Sometimes problems with uh, sensory input, proprioception. Those are all things that can cause people to feel 
an imbalance. You know, an, an inner ear problem is only one of them. And, and usually if it's the inner ear, then it's what we call true vertigo or movement sensation. So vertigo, what, what vertigo actually is, is any perceived movement that an individual feels. Sometimes it's a spinning sensation. Sometimes you just feel like you're moving about in space and you're not really moving. Um, and what we describe as dizziness is more of feeling off balance or off kilter or feeling like you're falling to one side. And that's usually not otologic in origin or inner ear in origin. Dr. Wallace, that answers the question. I have a question. Uh, have you ever treated, and I don't know if this is uh, an ENT question, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, cases of repetitive nasal cellulitis secondary to frequent nose picking. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> I, let me ask, how do you treat that? Like in folks- so, who, I mean, I, you have to stop the nose picking first and foremost, but usually it's uh, staph. Um, sometimes I'll culture the patient because we're seeing a lot of methicillin resistant staph, uh, but usually the treatment's the same. I'll usually use an anti-staph ointment, um, your puricin, you know, have the patient clean their nose because of crusting with uh, you know, peroxide using a, a Q-tip rather than their fingers. Uh, and then have them use the uh, Bactroban ointment uh, and, and then moisturize with saline. Uh, those are the things that we typically do. You know, if it's severe where there's actual cellulitis of the skin of the nose, then, you know, we'll end up putting them on, on you know, clindamycin or, or Keflex or something uh, along that line, along those lines. Dr. Hmm. Wallace, I, I appreciated your answer on um, dizziness. And I want to ask if from the ear viewpoint, is dizziness associated with actual loss of consciousness, fainting or passing out? I'll later on expand on, on from my viewpoint as a cardiologist, how I see mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. But maybe you can tell me if it can purely from the um, ear, so, nose, and throat. So system. yeah, so usually if a patient presents to me and it does happen, if they come to me and they're having episodes of what we call syncope or passing out or pre-syncope, feeling like they're gonna pass out, one of the first things I want them to do is actually have a cardiology workup that typically is not uh, uh, inner ear uh, issue. Uh, so it's pretty rare that someone with, you know, vertigo will, will say that they have a feeling of passing out or actually have passed out. Now they will fall sometimes and actually have head trauma, but usually they remember that feeling of, of vertigo before they fall. Whereas somebody who has, you know, as you know, has an episode of syncope, they, they don't remember the incident at all. And they just, they, they pass out. And so I'll, I'll want them to see a cardiologist, uh, uh, and a, a neurologist uh, as soon as possible. It, it is certainly one of the, the common complaints that we are presented with in, in the realm of cardiology. And I try to look to see if there's another associated symptom or underlying finding that I can relate to that. So just simple dizziness is very, very common when it, when it is raised to the extent of actual loss of consciousness, syncope as we call it. I have to look for a few major aspects of cardiac malfunction that may be related. And I certainly look to see if there's a structural abnormality with the heart such as um, valvular dysfunction, some of the valves that may not be functioning well, or if it's an irregularity, you know that things like atrial fibrillation, many people know of AFib, which is perhaps the most common irregularity of the heart, sustained irregularity in older patients. That's one of the things that can diminish the blood flow to the brain. Um, and there are a few other things that we look for, hypotension, or that is a falling of the blood pressure. People may get up from a sitting position and suddenly feel very dizzy and even faint. That sort of thing, we always tend to look for the pressure changes that occur, the blood pressure changes with changing position, so-called orthostatic hypotension, the fall of the blood pressure um, by a certain degree when changing from a sitting or laying position to standing. So I think we do cross over from time to time with some of your um, patients who have dizziness when it's a more profound nature, then we become a little bit more concerned from my viewpoint. Excellent, excellent. All righty. You know, there are other questions. Let's get, get a few of the few more done because they're coming up fast. Uh, do you advocate using rapid rhino to pack someone, to pack someone's nostrils if they are, are not an ENT specialist? Uh, yes, if they're trained to do it and there's significant epistaxis uh, uh, or nosebleed, then, then absolutely. Uh, yeah, if you're 
if you're trained to do it and, and, uh, and you have a patient who has a significant hemorrhage from the nose, then, then absolutely. Okay. Um, what, what they were asking was if you're, if, you're, if you're not trained to as an ENT person. Oh, uh, I mean, a patient doing it to themselves, that, that's pretty rare. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I would think. <laughs> <laughs> let's hope anyway um the thing of it is is that uh there's another question here let's go on um why do you think maternal uh, mortality is so high in the black community also what is the most uh, recommended time a, a a woman can give birth via uh, uh cesarean section dr anderson can you help I, us out I, with that sure um you know, let's tackle the maternal mortality um, issue. Um, it, it, it's a complex one. And, you know, I see this as two, two major um, faction which compete with themselves. Um, the first one is the medical industry itself. Um, I believe that um, as a provider of women's health, we could do better with respect to education. Um, with respect to counseling. Um, and this simply starts with an appropriate interview and listening carefully. Um, you know, while my primary specialty is cancer, um, where family history is important, um, with respect to maternal mortality, family history is important and personal history is important. It's very important to know um, um, history of diabetes, history of hypertension, history of um, thromboembolic um, issues, meaning blood clotting issues. Um, and then once you've um, assigned a set of risk factor to a patient, then that's a patient even before they get far into a pregnancy that you can assign a certain degree of risk factor to them um, and afford you to make the appropriate referral if that provider um, cannot um, or do it themselves. Um, then the other thing is, I think it's physiology. I think, you know, there are a set of standards that we use to um, identify problems. For example, um, what's considered an elevated blood pressure. Um, and I, we need to understand that if someone typically runs a very low blood pressure and now there's a, a, a trend going up, you don't make a diagnosis based on a single value, but you um, trend these patients, then you identify when that difference from their baseline to their current reading is becoming significant. The other thing I believe is that some of what's written in the textbook as being normal doesn't necessarily apply to some selective group of people, um, um, a group of patients. Um, so when we use um, common standards as opposed to um, um, sequences, series, and trends, sometimes we miss the boat. Um, the other thing is as a provider, you need to listen. Um, don't you know, um, not take what may seem like minor complaint as not being serious or what's common. Um, if someone tells you that this is an unusual feeling, my baby doesn't move, I have a headache, you know, I feel numbness on one side of the face, you know, don't try to rationalize it by saying, oh, this is probably how you sleep. You know, you're not paying enough attention to the baby's movement and that's why you think it that way. You know, no one complains because they like to complain. Or it's Dr. Salam may, may, may disagree. Um, you know, there's that di um, um, diagnosis also. But um, I think it, you know it starts with really listening. Start with um, um, paying attention to the patients, understanding the physiologic changes that occur during pregnancy, um, and have a set of standard as to what's considered you know normal deviation and what's not. Um, with respect to cesarean um, section. Um, you know, 39 weeks is the appropriate time to deliver um, a, 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 um, a, a term pregnancy of 30, 39 weeks and beyond. Um, with respect to when it's an appropriate time, it depends on the circumstance. It depends on maternal issues. So for example, if the mother has a heart disease, um, pulmonary disease that's worsening, then the optimal time becomes um, one of a balancing act. You know, when is she optimally um, able to undergo an operation versus when the fetus is mature enough to be delivered without significant morbidity and mortality. Um, 
um, you know, some of the other um, conditions are if there's um, um, fetal reasons, for example, abnormal fetal growth in utero, um, issues with the blood flow through the placenta, all these conditions can be evaluated um, by a, a maternal fetal medicine specialist. And in those situations, there never really is an optimal time. The optimal time is you know, not missing the opportunity to rescue a fetus by waiting. So you need someone who understand the parameters, what they're looking at to determine when a fetus is um, getting into trouble. Um, and there are several um, parameters that I know um, these um, individuals looked at, you know, how much fluid around the baby, the baby's movement, the pattern of growth, the rate of growth, and also um, um, patients with anatomic defects, right? So sometimes you have to time it so the baby is mature enough that should they get delivered, if they have an anatomic defect, such as, a, as a, an abdominal wall defect, to deliver them at an optimal time when they can safely undergo surgery to repair such a defect. So it's a complex one. Um, the issue of you know, timing for C-section, that has to be discussed clearly with your provider. What we do know is with subsequent pregnancies, one of the big contributor to pregnancy risk is previous C-section. So the push now is also encourage vaginal delivery and in patients who may have had one or two previous C-section to undergo a subsequent vaginal delivery. Um, because we know that you know, the, a, a defect or a scar in the uterus in of itself can create a risk factor for any subsequent pregnancy. You know, one of the uh, issues um, in terms of maternal mortality has been um, related to blood loss subsequent to delivery for various reasons. And uh, one of the, I'll say success stories um, relative to reducing the, the maternal mortality, uh, especially in black, black women, uh, occurred in California where they develop a comprehensive uh, quality improvement program that basically identified uh, where the women were having the highest rates. And, and they've uh, actually almost eliminated uh, the disparity between maternal mortality out in California. A number of states have started to follow their lead, but what it requires is most of the obstetricians agreeing to look at what's going on, especially hospital by hospital, and then to agree to enter into a, a, a process where they analyze and they put in um, mortality reject, reduction strategies to take place. Um, the New Jersey Hospital Association is starting to look at that. Uh, but if you look at um, you know, maternal mortality uh, reduction, uh, California took an initiative and they basically got everyone to get on board and they dramatically reduced and, and, uh, and almost have eliminated that disparity. So it takes work, but uh, for the most part, it, it's gonna require that the obstetricians, state by state, hospital by hospital, agree to look at what the problem is and what the, the, the mortality is in their communities and, and develop strategies to, to reduce it. And by paying attention to, to, to women and what happens with, with blood loss uh, subsequent to, to deliveries. Excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there, just let me know that, let you know that that was Dr. Kendall Sprout. Ken, uh, Ken can you please introduce yourself? Uh, I'm uh, Kendall Sprout, I'm a board certified uh, pediatrician. I'm now retired, but um, I specialized in um, general pediatrics as well as critical care pediatrics. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's go on to another question. Excellent. Uh, my right leg is swelling, and I know Dr. Dr. Garrison's not here, but maybe we can help this patient, um, my, this person. My right leg is swelling from lymphedema, which means that I have uh, to wear compression stockings. Will that condition ever go away? If I do nothing for, uh, if I do nothing for the swelling, could there be an ad adverse result? Um, any of the primary care docs handle uh, or have patients that have uh, lymphedema and, and how do you help these patients? Dr. Aluya, is there any, any help for these patients? Um, lymphedema can often be a very disturbing, uh, debilitating um, medical condition in the sense that uh, uh, it's often progressive and if you're not careful, it would uh, just go on and then you begin to see skin changes, um, erosions that take place, uh, the skin begins to really get bigger and fold on itself. 
and then ulcers begin to take place and then subsequently infections that take place uh, from fungal to bacterial infections. Um, unattended to would progress. So, but for patients of mine that I've had over the time uh, here in New Jersey, we've had um, a lymphedema clinic. So if you don't, uh, and surprisingly, you, you'd be shocked. A lot of people don't know that lymphedema clinic do exist. So um, if whatever state of where you are, ask for it or just look it up. And um, they have specialized nurses and doctors who take up of patients like that. And what they do, they have this, you know, wrapping um, methods that they, that they go sequential wrapping that they, that they do uh, for those patients as well, as well as uh, constant moisturize, moisturization and then taking uh, other uh, steps to mitigate um, uh, risk of infection and everything else. So um, yes, uh, look for one and then, you know, go get it, you know, looked at. In addition, if I... If I may oh, um, add to this. Um, All right. And then, then Dr. Court, a third. Uh, go ahead, Patrick. Um, I think first we must ask, what is lymphedema? And, um, you know, from a physiologic perspective, the body, like we have arteries, which carry blood to the various organs and veins, which return blood to the heart. We have um, these lymphatic channels, which flows into lymph nodes. And the role of these lymphatic channels really is to return any sort of um, serum type um, 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 if infiltrate back into the general circulation. So it essentially mixes with the blood and gets circulated. Now, lymphatic channels flow into lymphatic um, lymph nodes and these functions as filters. Um, and the general role of this system is to essentially filter foreign bodies, um, um, infectious agents, and can also filter out cancer. Now, from a cancer perspective, one needs to figure out, get a good sense as to what's causing this lymphedema. Um, is there an organic reason for it? Some of the more common um, causes are um, malignancies, cancerous growths. Um, and sometimes when you have um, swelling on one side, it's possible that you may have some sort of a lymphatic obstruction secondary to some sort of a malignancy. Um, if it's in the lower extremity, as in the legs, it could be something in the pelvis. Um, it could be um, something growing in the groin. Um, so one needs to have a comprehensive evaluation to make sure that there's no other process. Another reason is could be related to prior surgery. For example, you know, when we do cancer surgery and we do a lymphadenectomy, we um, obstruct or disrupt some of these lymphatic channels. They don't often regenerate and you can see um, swelling of the distal extremities, um, areas distal to the um, area of operation. Um, sometimes um, other types of treatment, for example, um, radiation treatment can cause, cause um, scarring and fibrosis and lymphatic obstruction. Um, and as a result, you have these swellings. Now, like Dr. Aluya says, um, and we're fortunate in our um, system to have several lymphedema um, um, therapy um, um, providers, who will do um, things like massages, um, com use compression devices to help um, limit the swelling. Um, um, you know, but the push now in oncology is to um, use lymphatic um, dissection um, in a very efficient way. So as opposed to doing complete lymphadenectomy, you do selective lymphadenectomy of regions that are more likely to be affected. And there are various means of doing that. Um, using injection of various dyes or radiolabeled um, nucleotide to do it. And this has been shown to limit post-surgery, post-treatment um, lymphedema. Excellent. As Dr. Anderson pointed out, though, there, there are several ways in which the fluid that is brought by arteries from the heart is returned towards the heart. And it becomes very important in recognizing these and, and ruling out other diagnoses rather than initially admitting that the swelling of one or both lower extremities is because of lymphedema. There are other common causes that one has to be aware of, which may require more abrupt, ready treated treatment. For example, clots forming in the veins may obstruct or prevent the return of blood through the veins back to the heart and may cause swelling of those areas. Simple things like heart failure, of course, it's just simple, but heart failure or uh, many other generalized causes may allow or diminish the return of blood to the heart. 
hence allowing the, the uh, swelling of one or both lower extremities. These are the sort of generalized conditions that need to be ruled out. And the decision made that it is in fact lymphedema and not swelling because of another treatable cause. Omar, in this area in which this doctor court, in which we practice, there are two areas where uh, lymphedema treatment can occur. One is at St. Barnabas Medical Center and the other one is at Trinitas Hospital. What they utilize there is, in addition to other measures, of course, is a lymphedema pump. And many of the patients have had fairly good results with that in terms of mobilizing the edema. Mm -hmm. I, uh, it, what I'd like to do, uh, Omar, is just um, dovetail a little bit with what um, Patrick and, and, and Trevor talked about. Uh, when we talk about edema, uh, edema really is an excess amount of the fluid that surrounds the cells in the body. And as uh, Trevor spoke about, uh, that volume of fluid that surrounds the cells is usually constant. That means it's being created and then it gets returned. And the creation of the, the, the fluid that surrounds the cells comes from uh, the narrowing of arteries that get smaller and smaller. And then a certain amount of that fluid that's within the blood vessels gets squeezed out at the capillary level and they surround the cells. And then it returns two ways. It returns via the veins and it returns via lymphatics. The reason it returns in the veins is because of what's called an oncotic pressure. But what that means is there's a certain level of protein that remains within the blood vessels. And as long as that ratio, the, that protein that's within the vessels, because there's very little protein uh, in the fluid that surrounds the cells, there's protein within the cells, a large volume of that fluid returns via the veins. And so when you think about edema, and, and again, we don't necessarily, and I think it is important, uh, you talk about lymphedema, but edema in general is an increase in that fluid. It can be created because there's an increase in the production of the fluid that might occur, which is somewhat rare, might occur with an allergic reaction. But for the most part, it, it relates to the fact that not enough of the fluid that's being created is returned. It can, not, that can happen either because of lymphatic obstruction or venous obstruction, or a low protein that's within the, the blood vessels, which, which decreases the, the return uh, to that. Now, as he said, if you have venous obstruction, and what, what, I, what I like to say, uh, Trevor, is that another form of venous obstruction is heart failure. Uh, because again, you start to develop a back pressure uh, the, the, that, that then starts to generate large volumes of fluid. So it becomes important to make a, a diagnosis as to whether what's the cause of the edema. Is it venous obstruction? Is it lymphatic obstruction? Is it increased production? And there are ways that you can do that. But I think that the issue is to focus on what's the cause. A lot of folks that have lymphedema, uh, some of them, there is no cause. If you think about what, what uh, Patrick says, if you have scarring or damage to uh, those lymphatic channels, that can be a, an issue with return. Uh, but generalized edema usually occurs from issues related to protein, sometimes with liver, sometimes with, with kidney losing protein, that you can develop a generalized edema. But if the edema is localized, it implies that there's really an issue related to probably venous obstruction, lymphatic obstruction, or maybe a vessel that, that might cause that back pressure that causes the edema. All right, excellent. Yeah, excellent. Omar, you know, not to belabor it, but as I look at the chat and the question, mm -hmm. um, it became a little clearer that the right. um, person who suffers from this unilateral lower extremity edema resulted um, from um, intervention from a, um, um, a dissected aortic aneurysm. Um, and it seemed like there was some decreased flow to that lower extremity associated with some swelling followed by um, fasciotomy to relieve pressure in the leg. And I think as a result, over time, once the fasciotomy scar is healed, some of the lymphatics might have become obstructed and now you have permanent um, lymphedema in that uh, lower extremity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent answer to, from everyone. There, there is a question. I was recently diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. What is the best treatment? Are there vitamins that I can take to help my immune system? So there are actually two aspects of this question. Um, I am assuming that they think uh, they, they're they're uh, correct that there are certain 
um, rheumatological diseases or autoimmune diseases that decrease the immune system. So uh, can we help out with this? Uh, either start off with Dr. Luya or Dr. Uh, Dr. Court. I know Dr. Court had just stepped away. Dr. Luya, can you start off with it? Maybe Dr. Court can help out. What's the question? <laughs> The question, the question, Dr. Court, was, I was recently diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. What is the best treatment? Are there vitamins that can help um, with my immune system? All right. Okay. Nelson. Go ahead, Doc. Either of you, Docs. Dr. Luya or Dr. Court? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, I, I mean, I think uh, Dr. Court was going to take it, right? No, I just... Let's... I no. leave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay now. I'm okay now. All right. So rheumatoid arthritis is one of the constellation of uh, inflammatory autoimmune diseases that that we do have. Um, you have lupus. You have rheumatoid arthritis. You have juvenile rheumatoid arthritis that usually occur in younger uh, age group. You have Chuck Struss and all the other ones that that we do have. Um, Nevertheless, uh, first you have to have made the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis and there are parameters upon which you make those. Usually clinically, they tend to have um, early morning um, aches and pain and joint swellings uh, in the digits. And they usually last longer than 30 minutes in the morning. And um, they do not get away, uh, get the, they, they tend to get a little better during the day uh, but then persist uh, subsequently. And those pain uh, will continue and it progresses with degenerative changes or damage to those joints. So you have disfiguring of the joints if it's not taken care of. Now, rheumatoid arthritis, because it's an inflammatory disease and autoimmune, autoimmune meaning auto, automatic, immune, your immune system fighting itself because something somewhere triggered it up. And uh, it's just like having soldiers you know, calling out the, the, the National Guard for something to fight. Now, when the problem has been resolved, uh, you need to call them out, back, but it's hard to call them back. So they just go around and then looking for something to fight. And if they don't find something to take care of, then they begin to attack uh, the individual. And they can come from the brain, to the heart, to the joints, to the kidneys, um, and, and even to the skin as well. So, um, and they can mimic other diseases. Uh, like lupus uh, as well. So make, first making those diagnoses, meaning you have seen the doctor who from test results and from your clinical uh, signs and symptoms made that diagnosis already. Uh, but then you tend to manage it with medications as well as parameters for, your, um, for, for the disease, meaning you check the ESR and CR uh, protein, which are inflammatory markers to tell if the treatment we're giving you is helping. Now, um, there are stages when you begin to manage this. Um, there are medical, uh, there are what are called medical therapies and non-medical therapies. Non-medical therapies I'll begin with first. Usually we encourage you to do some isometric exercises, uh, stretching, they tend to help uh, joint um, um, fluid resorption and relaxation, as well as circulation within the joints as well. It also helps reduce the inflammation that takes place. And then the damage that subsequently takes place within the joint. Yes, some multivitamins do take place and anti-inflammatory um, um, multivitamins, um, the ginseng and all the other stuff that people take, uh, ginger, uh, have anti-inflammatory effects. So yes, they do help. Now for mild cases, uh, you know, really onset uh, when it was diagnosed, um, you can use anti-inflammatory medications like uh, ibuprofen or naproxen to help reduce the inflammation. Now, come to think of it, um, there's a marker we use for rheumatoid arthritis. It's called uh, the rheumatoid factor. Now, a lot of the time they do that and then rheumatoid factor is negative, but the patient is presenting clinically with signs and symptoms with rheumatoid arthritis. So thank God with advancements of technology, we have what they call uh, anti-CCP, is anti-citrulated uh, cyclic peptide uh, that you can measure uh, to confirm that. So we do that together now because 30% of individuals may have negative rheumatoid factor, but then anti-CCP is positive. So coming to the medications, you take those uh, NSAIDs. Now, 
NSAIDs in itself, they need ibuprofen and all that. And high doses causes irritation of the GI tract. So some people have led to areas where they bleed and get ulcers. So, uh, but to help reduce that, you can use um, um, some drugs that would help reduce the inflammation. Of course, we have the um, hydroxychloroquine that's been talked about recently last year because it intrinsically has anti-inflammatory effects. But nevertheless, before you use that, you have to go see your eye doctor to make sure you clear, uh, cleanse you from the visual defect that they, that they could tend to have. Now you have other modulators that you can get. Now for acute cases, because rheumatoid arthritis can <laughs> waver up and down, uh, depending on the flare up, even viruses can make you flare up, stress can make you flare up. Now, if you have any of those to reduce the acute inflammatory process, you use steroids. And steroids are good, you give high doses, but you don't use them for long. Because if you do, then in itself would cause damage to the individual. Uh, damage to the hips, like Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Lee is not here, uh, um, osteonecrosis of the hip. Uh, they actually can reduce the skin te um, texture and turgor as well, as well as the uh, uh, inflammation within the brain as uh, they associated with. So, we, we tend to do that, but for a few cases, we can give them very low dose uh, to consistently take. Now, there are steroid um, sparing medications that you can use, uh, uh, cyclophosphamide and um, a few other ones that you can use. But with technology, we've advanced to a point where you use immune modulators uh, that actually attack certain specific areas of receptors that attach uh, those circulating antibodies that attach to the joint to help protect um, the joint. So those are the things we do use, but combining that, exercise, good rest, good food is really important. All right, thank you, thank you. Dr. Court, is there anything added? It was covered very well. Very well, sir. Not much. All right. Physical All right. therapy can help sometimes. I just, I just wanna to add to, to, to Nelson's uh, uh, thing. Go ahead, Dr. Uh, Sproul. Rheumatoid arthritis is, is uh, there's no cure for it. And as he said, these uh, antibodies start to attack either other antibodies or the, the, the cells that line the joints. And um, some of the newer uh, category of drugs, they call biologics or biologicals treatments. Uh, they're infusions. And sometimes these infusions, they're very expensive, but they can uh, last for uh, sometimes a month and sometimes three months. Uh, and so individuals that don't respond to uh, the, the, the common anti-inflammatories are to steroids. Um, and again, uh, anything that, that uh, uh, has inflammation has a number of characteristics, swelling, pain, redness, and, and in terms of joints, decreased mobility. Uh, and these individuals can really, really suffer. Uh, and if you don't move, then you start to have an impact on your muscles and everything else. So uh, part of the, the, the issue is, is getting regular treatment to try and control it. Uh, and uh, what's worked for uh, individuals that have what we call moderate to severe symptoms uh, are the biologics uh, that uh, you can get these infusions that, that really can last a long time and, and, and eliminate your need to take some of the uh, other medications that, that you might take. But a lot of these uh, medications, uh, the steroids and, and some of the um, really chemotherapy um, um, medications decrease your immune response, but also uh, increase your ability to, to, to possibly develop infections. Right. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I want to go to another question. This is a question that I think Dr. Fredericks may be able to help us with. I want to lose my belly fat quickly, it states. Uh, if I limit my diet to just meat and vegetables and eliminate carbs, will that do the trick? You said quickly. Unfortunately, um, when you, when you, you can't really spot reduce weight, okay? If you're going to lose weight, you're going to lose it all over. But when you start to notice the increasing in belly fat, you have to think that a person is becoming, developing more visceral fat and they're becoming more insulin resistant. And so... Having foods that are low in carb that won't spike your insulin levels may be helpful in reducing that area. So mm -hmm. that's what I tend to do when I see a patient that has, has um, increased belly fat. I, I measure the waist circumference and I see what that is. And then I look for certain labs, look for the hemoglobin A1C that tells me if they're getting more insulin resistant. And using certain medications to help control that, I tend to get that, that area um, controlled much faster. 
but mm -hmm. to lose weight fast, it's usually, it's, weight loss is very slow and mm -hmm. losing weight um, is, is tedious. Um, weight is a component of what we're eating. So eating healthy, eating better diets will tend to have you lose weight better, but really spot reducing in the, in the middle is really hard. Right. What about the let me ask a surgery. question? What, what about what about a yeah, well, surgery? Too. What about what about is as far as uh, exercising and key exercises that will will um, emphasize that particular area? Even that, when if you're exercising, you'll lose weight dynamically throughout mm -hmm. your system. Doing okay. more crunches, doing more ab work is going to lead to better weight loss in that region. You'll lose weight overall. Exercise is a key component. Yeah, definitely. But losing okay. spot reducing weight is hard. Surgery, of course, is going to lose weight all over as well. And, it, it, and you have to get a certain level before you can go and have weight loss surgery. And I, I tend to use that BMI. That's where I check for your height and your weight and I get a number and it tells me how heavy you are. But the BMI doesn't also tell me where that fat is, mm -hmm. right? And so I use uh, the waist circumference will tell me a better idea. And having surgery once it's past a certain level, that surgery will become helpful in losing weight. Right. Don't do surgery for cosmetics. Use surgery for, for helping um, a person get better. Um, right. And you, when, when a weight gets so problematic, it starts to cause health-related issues, that's known as morbid obesity, having that weight so high, then I do certain surgeries to help bring that weight down. Surgery mm -hmm. will get that weight down much faster than any other way of doing it. 42% of Americans are obese. Only one, one to 2% actually come to have surgery um, because a lot of people are scared of surgery. And surgery is actually very safe. Surgery is safer than having a gynecological surgery. Um, a bariatric surgery is very safe. Um, now, because of the, the expertise of the surgeons, you know, we, we, we do these things in a, in a, we get good visualization, we see really clearly what we're doing, and we're very adept at doing these particular surgeries. At one point, we used to do them open, and, and when we did it open, we ended up with much more complications. Now we do them laparoscopically, and the complication rate is very low. Mm -hmm. um, um, having surgery, a lot of um, organizations um, send their patients to us to have surgery because they're metabolic surgery. They help control certain things. They help control certain hormones and help you lose that weight um, expeditiously. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Question for Dr. Fredericks, question for you. So yeah. with, with bariatric surgery, do you see the loss of the visceral fat as well or is that more resistant? No, in fact, um, the endocrine society sends patients to get gastric bypass because right on the table doing a gastric bypass the insulin, the insulin levels start to decrease right away. So if a patient is chronically, um, has chronic diabetes, bar bariatric surgery, especially the gastric bypass is very um, um, curative for that um, condition. And so mm -hmm. you do lose that visceral fat. Right. Mm -hmm. If I may, if I may. Um, hold, hold on, hold on. Who is this? Dr. Luya, is that you? Yes. <laughs> All right, and there was someone else who, who spoke? I'll just ask him about liposuction. Okay, all right. So Dr. Luya first and then Dr. Sprout. Go ahead. All right. So often enough, we see the patients first and then we refer them to you. Now, I mean, we know some of the criteria, but you're the surgeon who does the surgery. Now, uh, two parts or three part questions. Who would you consider for surgery? That's one. Mm -hmm. uh, and how would you get that patient prepared for surgery? Because as we know, only 1% out of the 40% are coming for surgery because they are scared. And that's what we see in our community. They're scared. So how do you, you know, you know get them ready for surgery, counsel them? Uh, do you just pick them and, and start cutting them up open or? or I a wish. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, I'm a surgeon. I'll cut that anything. Before you do this. <laughs> well, what, what, what I do, um, again, I go by the BMI. Um, having a BMI of 40, that's when your weight is so high that you're going to lead to health-related issues, then surgery will be helpful. Having a BMI 35, and that's having a, a, a BMI 35, and then starting to have things like hypertension, diabetes, sleep apnea, all these things that can result from having um, your weight so heavy, these are people that qualify 
for weight loss surgery because weight loss surgery is actually curative. They get rid of their sleep apnea. They get rid of their hypertension. They get rid of their, their um, um, diabetes. So those are people that, that I tend to want to do surgery on. And when I prepare them, I have everyone is, is, um, goes to see a, a, a psychiatrist. I'm not trying to see if, whether you're crazy or not, but I want to make sure that you're ready to have that surgery because you have to undergo a lot of, of treatment to help you be ready to have surgery. Sorry. And also the thing of it is, is that post-surgery, understand that it's, it's just not the surgery. But then again, you still have to comply to the eating regimens. And, and that is very, you know, you're taking a person that is used to eating a certain volume or certain times a day, you know, either they eat and why do people eat? That's a good question as well. Do they eat because it's a pacifier for them? Do they eat under stress? Do they eat because they just have that stimulus in their, in their brain that, the, you know, and, and the type of foods they eat? is important as well. So all of that, that's a reason that psychologically and, and it's so important. I know Dr. Salim, I don't know if you actually, you know, counsel some people that are overeaters or eat for the reason of some certain psychological issues. A is pleasure. That right? Some people a comfort, some people for comfort, they're mm -hmm. accustomed yeah, to eating yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Salim, I, I'm, I'm more com I more commonly see youngsters who have eating disorders, the most common of which is binge eating disorder, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and many of them struggle with weight. Uh, however, I don't I don't know if their age criteria, but most of them have not been exposed to bariatric surgery. Mm -hmm. So right. uh, I think those that are the most severe and have the most significant medical comorbidities are subjected to that type of surgery, and it's typically adults. Mm -hmm. But while I have the mic. I have a question that I think either Dr. Fredericks or, or Dr. Bay could address. Do you have any recommendations in terms of starting an exercise program in someone who's largely sedentary and they're moving to change their lifestyle? Mm -hmm. Just, I think that the, the greatest difficulty is the initial step. What would you recommend? Yeah, you know, the I, thing, of, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Dr. Fredericks. I used to tell, just get out and start to walk. Mm. Walking movement, just any type of movement is important. The person who's sedentary, I tell them even standing up periodically in the chair and then progressing to walking, get a dog, do, do yard work. Um, all that movement is important and it'll start them progressing more and more. Um, give me, I tell them, give me three, three days, give me a, an hour of walking and something like that. It, go up and down the block first. And so it's a progressive type of thing of slowly starting to get themselves conditioned to doing more and more activity. Yeah, yeah, that's very important. I, I, I agree, 110%. Walking is the best exercise. Um, uh, I think there was a, 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 one of the people in the, the, the Kaiser uh, uh, you know, uh, um, medical care in, in California, mm -hmm. he, had, he had, uh, did a talk on the, the benefits of walking, and there were so many benefits from diabetes to hypertension to, to stress to just for walking a few minutes a day. Um, patients that are in wheelchairs, I mean, basically anything that you can move. If you can move your upper extremities, then move them. If you can, you know what I mean, wiggle around in the chair, wiggle around in the chair. If you can put music on and just pop up and down, it doesn't matter. Move. Movement is the most important thing that you can do. And get it started. And once you get started, try to do it every day, even if it's 10 minutes a day or 15 minutes a day, just so long as you do it each and every day. All right. I would tend to agree with, with some of the comments that you made, just with some caveats. Okay. I think it is important to recognize that a lot of the obese patients that we're talking about may have other concomitant disease. And so one has to be very careful in starting them off in an exercise program that we do no harm to their control of the other diseases. Therefore, I totally agree with Dr. Bay and Dr. Fredericks in the recommendation for gradual increasing exercises, starting at a low level. And in those who have defined severe disease, for example, heart disease, post-open heart surgery, et cetera, who may also be obese, that they have proper testing to be sure of their capacity to do exercises. Um, so we sometimes have to stress test patients, for example, before rec recommending to them that specific physical therapy be done once they've shown that they can pass an exercise test safely without any undue stress on the heart. So I think mm -hmm. important is frequency of exercise, amount of exercise, the timing of exercise, certainly not after a heavy meal, and um, 
and that the exercise, if necessarily, be properly supervised initially in those patients who are at most risk. Excellent. And, and Omar, I, I have to add that the most important thing if you're trying to lose weight is reducing your caloric intake. Well, that is true. Certainly exercise is important and, and, and people may not realize that the more obese you are, the more efficient you will lose weight via exercise. So if you looked at some of those uh, TV programs, the heaviest individuals with the same amount of exercise lose more weight. So it's very efficient for you to, uh, to exercise, but you, you, you know, a lot of folks who exercise then uh, treat themselves by eating more after they've exercised, which defeats the purpose. Uh, so I think that, that it, get hungry. a co combination of exercise plus reducing what you put in your mouth. Yeah. Well, that's, that's true. I, I think <laughs> what, 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 I, what I wanted the audience to appreciate was there's a very low barrier to entry in terms of starting an exercise program exactly. right. and the benefits of walking, which is something we all have to do anyway. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the main point I wanted to emphasize. That, that's yeah, a good yeah. point. That's definitely that. <laughs> and the fact that, you know, exercise is only about 18 to 20 percent of on the losing trip. weight, you know what I mean? As, as Dr. Sprock said, backing off the table and choice, portions and choices is the most important thing. And, 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 and surgery and surgery is only a tool. Surgery is only a tool to get you to eat better. Ultimately, it's the nutrition that'll keep that weight off long-term. Have lots of patients have lost their weight and they continue, they come say, Dr. Ferg, I lost all this weight, but honey, I still eat the same things I do and they slowly start to gain that weight back. Right. And so ultimately, use the surgery, if you get the surgery, to now learn how to eat better. Now, other than having them um, see a nutritionist before the procedure or the surgery, mm -hmm. is there a recommended amount of a percentage or amount of weight that you expect them to lose before the surgery? That's controversial. Mm. No. I. I, I if a person qualifies for surgery, I'm capable of doing the surgery on them. Um, yeah. Depending on the BM, some people want you to get a lower BMI that makes the surgery safer, mm -hmm. easier to do. But if one, I want that weight off because I, I see the benefit of them losing that weight and they'll lose the weight much faster when I do the surgery on them. Now, yeah. we're talking about yeah. surgery. What are uh, the possible complications before. of this surgery? Excuse me? What are the possible complications of rapid weight loss or the surgery? Um, from the surgery, a complication can arise um, from when you take one portion and, and attach it to the other portion, we call it anastomosis. There can be a leak in that area. And that's something that can develop um, in a person who is not well versed in doing these procedures. But nonetheless, these procedures are very, um, we, sit, we tend, we, we rarely see complications from doing um, these surgeries. <laughs> Alrighty. Dr. Sprock, you had a question? Uh, I want you to know with Dwayne, did this, uh, he see many patients that have uh, uh, had liposuction to deal with uh, reduction of belly fat? Um, liposuction tends to be on the fat above the portion, the, the, not the, you don't go deeper into the cavities to, um, to do liposuction. So you lose that, that, that subcutaneous fat, but you don't lose that deep fat. And so a person may, may lose weight, that belly fat, cosmetically, but um, physiologically, um, they're not using that visceral fat. You don't go to, into the visceral area to do um, liposuction. Mm -hmm. All righty. Dr. Dr. Fredericks, what are, if any, what are the most efficient ways to lose visceral fat? Visceral fat um, would be a, a surgery to lose that because you'll melt all that fat, the lower layers of fat. Um, nutrition, changing nutrition will help. Even <clears> like I mentioned, eating things that are less um, insulinogenic will help um, lose that, vis that visceral fat. That visceral <clears> fat is a metabolically active fat. And so using doing things that help control that will help you lose that weight, yeah, that yeah. visceral fat. All righty, excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. At this time, uh, and Dr. Salam, remind me uh, when when I come back, I have a question specifically for you here. Uh, but we, we're going to we're going to go into our it's a, it's, it's uh, halftime, uh, as we can say in the sports arena. But uh, what I'd like to do is just, uh, just uh, several things. Number one, 
I'd like to just reintroduce the fact that, you know, we're uh, African-American physicians and our goals is number one, to, um, to improve health in the African-American community. And number two, to encourage young black males to think about going into medicine because it's at this time it's a it's a it's a it's a health crisis that we have very few black males going into medicine so we truly want to mentor we want to encourage we want to um, let young black males know that it is possible and to please think about healthcare as a as a as a uh, as a career uh, our webinar uh, uh, is on youtube and you can access this by going to OB Healthy. That's the, the letter O, the letter B, and healthy, uh, dot com. Uh, and also, you can uh, go straight to YouTube. All of our past webinars are, are on YouTube. So please, you know, subscribe when you go to that. Um, understand that um, you can continue to ask your medical questions. Those that are on that may be a little shy, just type in your medical question. We're eager to answer them. Uh, this, the one thing that's most important is do not change any aspect of your medical care until you consult your physician. That is so important. No matter what we say as far as medical medicine is concerned, do not change any aspect of your medical care. Only your doctor, your physician best knows how to treat you and your medical problems. Alrighty, and I would like to thank OB Healthy for allowing us to use their platform to bring this webinar to you. We're going to reintroduce ourselves because hopefully um, we can let everyone know who have come come in late, uh, each of us as far as our specialty is concerned. Dr. Court, can you start off, please? Dr. James Court, Internal Medicine, East Orange, New Jersey. All righty. Um, Dr. Sal Dr. Salam. Dr. Kareem Salam, adult and child and adolescent psychiatry, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Excellent. Dr. Atherley. My name is Trevor Atherley. I'm a cardiologist based in Newark, New Jersey. My specialty, subspecialty, is interventional cardiology. All righty. Thank you. Dr. Fredericks. Hey, I'm Dwayne Fredericks. I'm a bariatric surgeon. Um, I practice in South Orange, New Jersey. I actually do, um, now I do primarily med medical management for obesity. All righty, Dr. Aluya. Uh, Nelson Aluya, Medicine Pediatrics um, here in Newark, New Jersey. Excellent. Dr. Sprott. Uh, Kendall Sprott, um, Pediatrician, uh, General Pediatrics and Critical Care Pediatrics. All righty, and Dr. Wallace and Dr. Pat, Pat who came on? Uh, I'm, still, I'm still here. I just lost my video for some reason. Yeah. Oh, all righty, I'm sorry, oh, Dr. Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I, I can't get the video back. I, I may have to sign out and sign back in. But that's um, fine, Dr. Dr. Wallace. If you if you have to do that, just go right ahead and pop right back in. We'll understand. Okay, uh, Dr. Derek Wallace. I'm a, a otolaryngologist, uh, general ENT uh, in practice in Nutley, New Jersey. I'll, I'll sign out and then sign back in. All right. Thank you. Yeah, and Omar, Dr. to say here, I, yeah, I lost my video as well. But I'm Patrick Anderson. I'm a board certified gynecological oncologist. I'm practicing out of Newark, New Jersey, um, Newark Bethesda Medical Center, and an office in South Orange. Excellent. Patrick, you can sign back in. Just sign out and sign back in. We will understand. Um, thank you very much. Do Dr. Salam. Yes. There, there was a question that came up, and that please talk about teenage Black males and bipolarism. Can you help us out with that one? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I, I answered that in the chat, but just to expand a little more. So bipolar disorder, something folks need to understand is it's a term that's often misused uh, because it's not well understood. So if you break it down, bi meaning two, polar meaning poles or opposite ends like the North Pole and the South Pole. But in this case, the poles are depression, which more commonly presents in adults as sadness and the blues, and depression more commonly presents in youngsters as anger and irritability. And then on the other, the other pole, the opposite pole is mania. So mania is associated with, uh, in youngsters, it's associated with mood dysregulation, extremes of emotion, uh, happiness, sadness, anger. Uh, it could be associated with explosive behavior. And then as you get older, you could have very discrete manic episodes that are associated with racing thoughts. Your thoughts are moving so quickly, your mouth can't keep up. A central feature is grandiosity or an inflated sense of who you are and what you've achieved and what you're capable of. 
sleep difficulties, and a propensity towards recklessness. So whether it be uh, a ver being very sexually promiscuous, um, spending money recklessly, um, uh, engaging in uh, just really uh, allowing your appetites to kind of take over your life. Um, and so it could have tragic consequences for someone's life. Now, in terms of diagnosing bipolar disorder in an adolescent, I'm very skeptical of that diagnosis in the absence of a family history. So among psychiatric disorders, bipolar disorder is highly heritable. So it's passed through the genes pretty effectively. And there's no specific bipolar gene. But if no one in your family has depression or a history of depression or bipolar disorder, and you're, trying, you're insisting that your youngster has bipolar disorder, is it possible? Yes. Is it highly likely? No. Uh, and bipolar disorder is not more commonly, uh, or here, African-American males, teenage boys, are not more commonly affected by bipolar disorder than other demographics. So about 1% of the population is actually, that's the prevalence of bipolar disorder. Um, the treatment involves, it typically involves medication if you have an accurate diagnosis. What I find particularly frustrating is folks say, oh, he or she must be bipolar. Well, how come you say that? Well, one minute they're happy, the next minute they're sad. Well, listen, we have fluctuations in mood throughout the day. And so what you're looking for are mood episodes. And those mood episodes, they become more discreet as you get a little older and they, they could last as long as five days to a week, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of uh, treatment, uh, you could treat bipolar disorder with mood stabilizing medication but I insist that the diagnosis be made carefully because first line mood stabilizing medication like lithium and Depakote has really harsh side effects. And when you're dealing with a youngster, you don't want to expose them to medications with harsh side effects, potentially if they have a condition that uh, may last for decades. So when you're medicating the brains of other people's children, you don't think of the most effective medication first. You think of the medication with the fewest side effects. And all of us in, in medical training, we've heard of uh, primum non nocere, first do no harm. So that's a little bit about bipolar disorder. Uh, and a final fact is that it's bipolar disorder is often underdiagnosed in African-American males uh, and schizophrenia is more commonly misdiagnosed and African-American males and schizophrenia has a more poor prognosis than bipolar disorder. Salam. Dr. Salam, you know, I, um, I'm old, but when I was uh, training in pediatrics and, and the first years out, I never heard of bipolar disorders in children. And 20 years later, I started to see increasing diagnosis of bipolar disorder in children, not even teenagers. Could you comment on uh, this? newly diagnosed children with bipolar disorder? Sure, that's an, uh, an excellent, um, uh, excellent anecdote, Dr. Sprott. Uh, I, I don't, I don't wanna get too specific here, but there were specific research shops uh, in, in this country uh, and specific investigators that, um, you know, they, they were known for any case that was brought in uh, these, these young kids were diagnosed with bipolar disorder and it led to some controversy. Um, and some of these centers were, were, were based in the Northeast. And so there was an explosion of the diagnosis. And that's why I, I mentioned earlier that in the absence of, of a family history, I really meet that diagnosis with considerable uh, skepticism. Um, so, uh, um, and, and, uh, some of these researchers had relationships with uh, Big Pharma uh, in terms of, um, you know, some of their grants and, the, and their studies. And so there was some controversy about that. However, uh, it is a, a real diagnosis. And there are some kids who come from families uh, where the disorder spans several generations. But I would say the hallmarks to, to look for are the heritability, so the family history, 
and sleep difficulty. So you could have, so one of the questions I might ask is, uh, what's the greatest number of consecutive days or back-to-back -back days that, that you've gone without sleep? And uh, sometimes there are folks who, I'm very concerned if uh, that number you could round up and get to one week. So if it's five days, six days, or sometimes more than a week, uh, and then there, there's elevated risk of psychosis and actual suicide if you can't slow your brain down enough uh, to, 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 to actually get sleep. Uh, Salam. Yes. Go ahead, Dr. Court. Dr. Salam, you were basically, when you started your talk, you were focusing on young adults. How about adults? Because just like you, I frequently hear from patients, oh, he, she got he bipolar, she's bipolar. What should we look for or what predominates in the older adults? So the sure. Or the depression? So uh, with the depression, now, the other thing to remember is with bipolar disorder, it commonly presents with manic episodes and depressive episodes, but you cannot make a diagnosis of bipolar disorder if you have not had a single manic episode or hypomanic episode in your entire life. So hypomania is a more a less severe form of mania. So what you look for in adults are, uh, you know, uh, rapid shifts in mood, um, racing thoughts, sleep difficulty. The symptoms could also lead to, uh, really you're looking for impairment and functioning. So it could lead to occupational difficulties. It could lead to uh, marital difficulties, difficulties in your interpersonal relationships. And imagine if uh, your sexual appetites are increased and you become very impulsive, you could have uh, higher rates of impregnating others, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, you could have people who impulsively, you read about this in the textbooks, and every now and then you discover this. You could have folks uh, who are very grandiose, and that may present itself in terms of religiosity uh, and feeling that they have uh, powers like a deity. Um, so those are things you're, you're, you're looking for, uh, particularly in adults. You see more discrete manic episodes. They're more common in adults than in kids. But I would focus on the sleep difficulty, the grandiosity, and the family history. Excellent. Excellent. All righty. Uh, Dr. Dr. Wallace, are you still with us? I know we're having, we're trying to solve the, the, um, you know, the visual uh, problem. Yes, I'm still here. Okay. There's a question. Uh, is nerve damage uh, to the mandible, uh, to that mandible nerve reversible? And what exercises or methods can be done to remedy the issue? So, um, it's, it's a little hard for me to answer this question because mm -hmm. I'm not sure specifically which nerve we're talking about. Right. Um, so if it's an injury that occurred, so the most common injury is during extraction of the molar tooth to the sensory portion of the mandibular nerve that runs through the mandible. Um, and typically, as far as I know, there's no medications that you can take to reverse that. Now, I'm not an expert in that particular injury because that's more in the realm of the oral surgeon. Um, however, uh, however, there are the nerves that we injure sometimes during surgery, such as a recurrent laryngeal nerve that controls the voice box. And when I have patients who have those injuries, I have them take supplements such as B12 or B complex that have been shown to help uh, in nerve rehabilitation. So that's one thing that I think is certainly possible. I don't know about any type of physical therapy to, to um, help uh, return function to that, uh, that um, mandibular nerve. Now, there's a, there's a motor nerve that has a similar name um, that can be injured during surgery or from trauma that controls the movement of the lower lip. That's a branch of the facial nerve. And when that nerve is injured, you know, depending upon the injury, whether it's a crush injury, it, certainly if the nerve is cut, if, if the nerve is not uh, rejoined or re then the function is probably not going to come back. 
However, if it's a crush injury, then again, taking those supplementations uh, uh, th that I mentioned previously, trying to exercise the lower lip, um, it's possible to, to regain some function of that nerve. So I, I hope that answers the question, but I don't have uh, enough information really to, to, to give more specific answer. All righty. Okay. May you utilize, uh, uh, or, may, may you utilize the expertise of our guest, Dr. Wallace. Yes. Um, sometimes our fields overlap, and one of the areas in which they do is in my patients, whom I have for a variety of cardiac disorders, to place on anticoagulants, blood thinners, <laughs> or on the lesser form, antiplatelet agents, which are a milder form, not quite as potent as anticoagulants. However, many of my patients who find it necessary to utilize these medications have bleeding from the nose or epistaxis. Is there anything you can tell me and tell my patients in terms of the investigation of that nose bleeding in patients in whom it is necessary to have such medications? What do we do with them? Yes, well, my hope is that those patients can get off of those medications, but I know that that's not a reality. Um, so, and I, you can't see the smile on my face while I'm, while I'm answering this question because this is very, very common, uh, as you know, because more and more patients are on antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulation now. Um, so epistaxis can sometimes be very, very simple and can sometimes be one of the more complicated and life-threatening things that we deal with in otolaryngology. Um, so simple nosebleed typically, or the most common nosebleeds or most common uh, types of epistaxis come from the septal area, which is that central part of the nose that separates the right side of the nose from the left side of the nose. From this area, we call Kesselbach's plexus. It's, the, it's a confluence of, of um, capillaries, and it's the most common area for epistaxis or for nosebleeds. And a lot of times, it's a matter of moisturizing the nose. Um, and, you know, in the Northeast, uh, where we have uh, uh, changes in temperature, we have very dry, cold winters, the rates of epistaxis go up whether the patients are on anticoagulation or not. Uh, however, those patients who are on anticoagulation and those bleeds can be quite prolonged and, and quite significant at times. Uh, so typically the first order of treatment is to make sure that the patients are moisturizing the nose with saline and I prefer saline gel to just spraying the nose with saline. Uh, sometimes using antibiotic ointments in the nose too are helpful as well to coat the lining of the nose and try to prevent the nose from, from drying out and also using humidification as well. Um, patients who are on anticoagulation, of course, the platelets are, or antiplatelet therapy, the platelets are not aggregating, they cannot form a clot. And so what happens is you have an open cavity in the nose and it just constantly bleeds and the bleeding sometimes will not stop. And in those patients, sometimes we have to cauterize the nose. And, and we do that in two ways. One, one way is using a chemical cautery by using something called silver nitrate. And then when we have a more serious or uh, 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 bleed, sometimes an arterial bleeder, we have to do what's called electrocautery uh, to, to stop the, the nosebleed. And, and that can become quite difficult in patients who are on anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy. And sometimes we even have to pack the nose temporarily until they form a clot and then remove the packing in you know, 48 hours, 72 hours uh, after. The more challenging nosebleeds come from the, the middle portion of the nose or, what we, or, or the posterior or uh, uh, aspect of the nose. And, and, and those nosebleeds can be life-threatening and, and uh, sometimes very difficult to control. And, and that usually requires surgery uh, where we go in with endoscopes to try to cauterize those bleeding uh, areas or clip the vessels that are bleeding. And that can be quite challenging in patients who are anticoagulated because we're, as we're going in, sometimes we have to uh, perform surgery on the septum and that causes bleeding. So, so these things can be quite, quite a challenge uh, uh, for the otolaryngologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Very good. I have a question. I have a question also uh, about hoarseness. Hoarseness is a problem that I, in my practice, I come across quite often being a pulmonologist, especially with patients with sarcoid that may have sarcoid nodules or polyps around the vocal cords. 
Um, can you well, also, uh, there's another thing that, uh, another uh, diagnosis that I, I don't see frequently, but it's, uh, several times during my practice, uh, that recurrent, re, re, uh, recurrent nerve that you talked about that goes around mm -hmm. in the order. And if they mm -hmm. have left hyalur uh, adenopathy, either just uh, usually not from sarcoid, but that's usually from a cancer and the patient gets uh, hoarseness. Can you uh, comment on how we can help people that come in hoarse? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, so hoarseness, certainly from the patient standpoint, you know, if you're having prolonged voice changes or hoarseness that lasts more than a week, uh, you know, that's that's a reason to get in and see a physician. Uh, you know, certainly you can see your primary first and if you, if you cannot get into an, an ear, nose and throat doctor, but, but that's a reason to get in and, and be seen and to have your vocal cords looked at. Uh, hoarseness, the, the, the most common causes of, of hoarseness, hoarseness are inflammatory changes, what we call acute laryngitis. And sometimes that can come from an episode of, of prolonged voice use or what we call vocal abuse, where the, you know, you're at a game or you're at a party and you're yelling excessively. Um, you know, that can cause inflammation of the vocal cords and, and that can cause hoarseness. But that's usually self-limiting and it'll last a couple of days and improve with voice rest. Um, However, if the hoarseness is prolonged or if the hoarseness is associated with throat pain, then that is far more serious and that needs to be investigated. Um, so typically when a patient comes in uh, with hoarseness, we, we want to look at the vocal folds or the vocal cords. And, and the way we do that is with a, with a special flexible scope that passes to the back of the nose so that we can see the, the larynx or the voice box and look at the anatomy of the vocal cords to see how they're moving and to see if there are any lesions or scarring of the, of the vocal cords. So that's the important thing to do uh, if, if the patient has hoarseness said that I, I would say lasts more than seven days, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, now, as far as ca causes of hoarseness, you know, again, I mentioned the acute inflammation, which you know, typically we'll, we'll treat with anti-inflammatories and voice rest and sometimes antibiotics. Um, you know, but then if, if the patient, of course, has a vocal cord paralysis and that's a situation where one of the vocal cords or both of them are not moving properly, then that has to be investigated. Um, and, and typically what we're looking for is for pathology either at the level of the vocal cords by way of uh, growth on the vocal cords or a, a, a tumor, um, you know, either cancerous growth or, or benign growth on the vocal cords that can cause hoarseness. Uh, or, or we're looking for something along the course of that recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, that might be causing some compression of the, of the nerve that's resulting in that, that nerve not firing and that cord not functioning properly. Uh, and so typically I had a gentleman in the office, an 80 year old with congestive heart failure who came in with chronic hoarseness and he, his right vocal cord was, was paralyzed. And so, you know, I ended up having to send him for a CAT scan of the neck and chest to, to make sure that there was no growth either within the neck or within the chest area uh, causing compression of that nerve and, and, and resulting in his Vocal, for, vocal cord paralysis and, and hoarseness. And he didn't have either of those. I think it was probably related to his congestive heart failure and enlarged heart causing some issues with, with, the, uh, with, the, with the vocal cord. And then you have what's called idiopathic vocal cord paralysis. So that's a vocal cord paralysis that's not associated with either uh, you know, uh, something injuring the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, or an anatomical problem, uh, tumor growth. It's basically just loss of function of the nerve that theoretically we believe that the pathophysiology of that is viral infection leading to some inflammation of the vocal cord that results in the paralysis. And that's, if we treat it, if we see that early enough, we treat that with uh, anti-inflammatory and usually the, the function of the nerve uh, uh, will return. Excellent. There, I have a question. Uh, that several of my patients are getting Botox. That seems to help as far as hoarseness is concerned. Are you familiar with that at all? So yeah, that's that's more for for uh, what we call spasmodic dysphonia, where there is it's a situation where there is hyperfunction of the muscles of the larynx. And the, what the Botox does obviously is paralyze the nerves temporarily uh, to decrease that hyperfunction and, and improve the voice. 
Mm -hmm. Excellent. What's, Excellent. Your, what's your take on uh, chronic alcohol uh, and, and smoking on, on um, horsemen? Uh, uh, yeah, that, that question, <laughs> hold that question. Dr. Wallace and Dr. Patrick Anderson, for the audience, we must, uh, we must apologize. We're having a, a little difficulty with Zoom. Can you, Dr. Wallace and Dr. Patrick Anderson, can you um, restart your video, try to restart your video? We've been trying to okay. solve the problem, okay? Um, Dr., um, oh, there we go. go. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> um, Dr., Dr., uh, Aluya, uh, could you answer, ask your question again? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I said, is there a causal relationship with long-standing or chronic smoking and alcoholism with hoarseness? I, I know it's been related to, um, you know, head and neck uh, cancers, but, you know, with, with that. So, uh, yes, and, and typically the, the, the major uh, issue that can develop is, you know, cancer of the, of the larynx. So, but there are benign uh uh, changes of the vocal folds that can occur with uh, with smoking and alcohol use as well. Um, you can get some scarring of the vocal cords that can occur with smoking. But the most common thing that we see, unfortunately, is laryngeal cancer that causes hoarseness. Um, and that has a, a high association with alcohol and, and tobacco use. Um, yes. All right, thank you, uh, and and thank you for opening up your your camera, your video, and you, Dr. Anderson, you're you're live again as well. So thank you very much. Good to see you guys. <laughs> All righty. So um, there's one. So one thing I do want to bring up, if I if I go may, ahead. just 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 as a point of information. Oh, go uh, ahead. So what we're seeing now um, is in the United States. You know the rates of smoking, in particular, have have diminished over over the past couple of decades. However, we're still seeing the rates of, of head and neck cancer that uh, that that have. So we're not seeing the, the the decrease in head and neck cancer to go along with that because there's another associated factor with head and neck cancer, and that's called human papillomavirus. And right. so we're seeing more cases of HPV related head and neck cancer now than when I started training 20 years ago. Uh, and that's something that I think patients need to be aware of. Um, and so that's, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, and we can certainly have another discussion about that at some point, but I just wanted so, to bring that up. Yeah, so just to comment on that, that's one of the reasons why when we talk about vaccinations, um, we should continue to advocate that young men and young women um, continue to get the HPV vaccine. And, you know, we have a vaccine now um, that um, uh, provide protection against nine of the high-risk HPV um, viruses. Excellent, excellent. There's a, there's a question, and I think this is, this connects to all of us. I've been in. Uh, I have seen in our community people not uh, having PCP or primary care physicians, and uh, don't get check check up uh, until they have a problem. Please give some tips on finding a primary care physician. All righty. Um, I think it, 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 I don't want to start that one off, but uh, can it, 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 maybe the primary care docs should, you know, how do we find a primary care physician in our community? And, and when do we know we have a good one, number one? Number two, uh, if we don't have a good one, uh, what should we do? Um, you know, give us some idea as far as finding a doctor holding on to that doctor and um, knowing that the doctor is appropriate for us for our medical care. Omar, I thought at one time, Dr. Court, I thought at one time you had a list of black physicians in this area. I think um, you were yes. part of your book. Yeah, we, that, we, that's one source. We, <laughs> yeah. That's your source. Yeah, yes. we, we, and we put out the African-American physician directory for many, many years. Uh, believe it or not, we plan to um, pull that list together and and, and put it out again for the New York, uh, Philadelphia, uh, uh, and New Jersey area. But at this particular point, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're in that gathering, um, uh, uh, you know, doing that, that information gathering. But at this particular point, let's see if we can answer this question. How do we choose a good doctor and, you know, for us? You know, uh, um, I just, I'd I like to start it out just from the pediatrician's uh, standpoint. Um, I think one of the things that um, has changed over time is uh, most of the docs used to go to the hospitals. 
Um, and very often the nurses know who the best doctors are because they see who comes in, who are diligent and, 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 and what happens. So very often if you have nurses that are familiar with a wide range of doctors that work in hospitals, they can sort of give you an idea. It's also good, you know, if you ask a doctor who their primary care doctor is, uh, because uh, in general, they won't go to someone that's not going to treat them um, uh, very well. So, you know, uh, my cardiologist is Dr. Anthony. Uh, so if someone says, uh, well, who, you know, who, who you recommend? I said, my cardiologist is Dr. Athley. So if I think enough of Dr. Athley, then you should think enough of Dr. Athley. And so I think that if you know of in individuals that are in the healthcare field, uh, they will usually give you recommendations that make some sense. You know, one of the things that, that uh, uh, Dr. Cart mentioned is, 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 is something that, that, is, that is important because they're often in these large groups, they like to keep the money and the patients within those groups. And so if there's a referral, that referral goes to a specialist that's within the group. Uh, so I think it, it is important for you to, to um, um, be aware of, 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 of healthcare professionals. And, and, and again, a lot of the, 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 uh, the, the um, uh, availability is related to your insurance and whether or not they're on the plan or not. Uh, but I think that if you uh, know of healthcare professionals and they can direct you as to who their doctors are, uh, that, that, that's a good way to start. All right. One of the conundrum we have is, you know, I know certain insurance companies have in the past, in recent past purged physicians off your list, um, certain subspecialists, you know, certain primary care doctors. Um, and I often say to patients, you're your best advocate. And I know said, in, you know, it said insurance company, my, myself was one of those physicians who patients had advocated for. We've seen this physician for many, many years. And now you tell me I can't. And the message often is a mixed message. The insurance company is telling them the doctors don't want to participate. And actually, that's not true. Um, certain insurance companies do purge physicians from their list. Um, the other thing is, you know, it, 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 is, is, is word them out, like Dr. Spratt said. Um, um, the second thing is to answer the question as to how do I know if that person is the right um, physician for me is just pay attention to the amount of time, the amount of caring. Um, I've often seen from in the subspecialty world where um, individuals leave and go to some well-known high-powered institution. They come back and you say, you know what, doc? These doctors, they care about the disease, not the patient. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, you find someone who actually strike that balance. You know, you're concerned about what ails, but you are also is concerned about who is being ailed. Yeah. Um, I think there are other things that we should, we should note too. When you go to your doctor, number one, write down your questions. I know a lot of times I hear, you know, I went to the doctor and I, 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 I had something to ask him, but, you know, I had several questions. I, when I got there, I couldn't think of them. Uh, you know, that's so, so common. And number two is that if you have family members that are satisfied with their physician, ask them about their doctor. Church members, go to people that you feel that will give you an honest answer and that are concerned about themselves and taking care of themselves. And if they feel comfortable and, and solid about their doctor, then they may give you a, a good referral. Any other, any other uh, statements as far as this is? Well, I mean, we talked about this uh, over and over again uh, from time to time. And um, first, you know, ab initio from the beginning, if you have an insurance card, you need to have a primary doctor, period. And if you can't find one, ask your um, uh, insurance company to recommend one for you. Usually they do. And then you go see that doctor. Now, going to see your primary doc doctor is a very important uh, visit. Uh, it's almost like you getting ready to go to church. You got to get prepared. And, and it's not, you, you just don't get up and, and go see your doctor. You have to get prepared. One, all the medications you're taking, you have to write them down or take the bottles with you. Uh, write down all your questions, like you said. And, um, you know, know your history, your family history as well. Yeah, uh, uncle, important. Brothers, mom, dad, all of those things together so that you don't miss stuff. I mean, you could find somebody who died in your family who was 44 uh, from uh, um, colon cancer, you know, and you don't know, and you're 54 or 45. So all of those things are really important. So you have to do your due diligence uh, before you go and get ready, get 
dress well, um, <laughs> put on nice clothes to go there so that, you know, if you're seeing somebody who is not of the same, you know, uh, skin tone or racial background, they will not discard you like something who that came out of something else. Because we know the study that shows that those who are taken care of by the people who look like them tend to do better, no doubt. But then if you go there and you, you know, interact with the doctors, they have great doctors from other uh, ethnic backgrounds as well who do great jobs. But then just like uh, Dr. Anderson has said, if you meet them, you, you know, just feel, feel what they're saying. You know, is he spending only 15 minutes with you and just checking out or not caring about, you know, just cutting you off every time you try to talk and you can't explain yourself or say stuff, you know, uh, or, you know, especially for the first visit. Now, if you're not satisfied with that, then, you know, you ask your neighbors or ask them whatever. But before you even go there, ask around. Google as well. What's the ratings? I mean, all doctors get ratings these days. Google around. Ask your brothers and sisters, do you know this guy? You know, what is he? And, and stuff like that. So, and if you're not satisfied, then you have the right to look for another doctor as well. And look, if possibly, look for a doctor who of the same ethnic background who understand you, understand the disease, and understand even the kind of food that you eat. I mean, we talk about <laughs> food and obesity and, and, and food content. Those things matter. I mean, if I'm uh, Nigerian, I eat Eba. You guys don't know what Eba is. And you're going to counsel me. It would be really difficult to tell me <laughs> what it is. You know, So all of those things put together the timing your outcome when it comes to healthcare. So those are the things, you know, I say, do your due diligence, get ready, pre-prepared, write everything down and approach your doctor. Um, do your thing. Yeah, I also think we just, should address the just, issue uh, of access. Hold, hold, right? hold on, hold on. We got, we got Dr. Kendall Sprott, I think, and then we got yeah. Patrick Anderson. One, and one then me, the, don't forget. Yeah. All right, <laughs> and Dr. Salam. All right, go ahead. We got a long one of the major here. issues is, is whether or not you can actually communicate with your doctor or not. You know, uh, and, and very often in, in, in certain uh, practice groups, you don't see the same doctor. Every time you go, you get another doctor. Uh, and sometimes you want to talk to the doctor and you get um, a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. Uh, and so the issue, it becomes uh, somewhat difficult. Uh, and, and let me tell you, uh, given today's practices, uh, lots of physicians are on the clock. They don't have a lot of time and they have other folks that try and handle the majority of, of things and they won't let you talk to them. Uh, and some, some practices will, will have the ability to communicate via uh, emails or text messages and things like that. So you should ask these questions about when I need to talk to my doctor, can I talk to my doctor or how does it work? When I make an appointment, am I gonna see my doctor? Am I gonna see a physician's assistant? Who am I gonna see? And how easy is it for me to communicate with them if you have a simple question or a simple problem? Those things are very, very important because lots of folks, you know, you, you know, can't can't get to speak to the doctor that can handle something very, very quickly, and you just out there. Yeah, excellent, Dr. Patrick Anderson, and then Dr. Salam. No, I was going to say, um, you know, that we shall not be um, 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 overlook the, the issue with access, right? Um, um, a lot of folks really cannot afford to find or privately fund their healthcare. So we should bear in mind that even though it may sound hypocritical, um, health, any healthcare is better than no healthcare at all. Um, so we should also um, um, be reminded that we have those federally funded um, 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 healthcare um, clinics in many of the communities Right. Um, so there is some access there. And then just to briefly say, sometimes the appropriate use of institutions, right? So we should encourage people to find a primary care physician, whether through their insurance providers, through the federally funded system, or through some of the means we, we, we just mentioned, and limit the emergency room and the urgent care centers to urgent needs and emergency needs. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Don't use emergency, like some of these urgy centers as your primary care. Not good practice. Dr. Salam. And just to kind of piggyback off, off what you said, Omar, Dr. Bay, uh, when I reflect on my own life, some of the best referrals I've gotten have been from word of mouth and, and friends. So, uh, you know, if you respect your friends and you think they have good judgment and that they're smart, uh, they're, they're probably not going to do you any harm. 
So I actually, uh, my current primary care physician, the referral came from uh, very close friends of ours who, who were really pleased uh, with, with this particular physician. Uh, and so I gave them a try and it, and it worked out. Uh, and that's how I got a good electrician. And you just, you want reliable folks who are really conscientious and uh, in terms of uh, what, what we learned in medical school is the importance of taking a history. And so the, the fancy studies with the be bells and whistles tend to confirm what you already suspect uh, and, and, and what's really high on your list of possibilities, your differential diagnosis, if you've taken a thorough history. And that involves a lot of listening and, and not as much talking but a lot of listening and asking the right questions. So uh, that's really important in terms of a primary care physician. And, you know, if you have good friends you trust, uh, you should ask them. And hopefully the, your experience with the primary care physician will mirror theirs. Excellent. I, I also want to say, you know, try not to go into the doctor's office with your idea of what your diagnosis is. I know there's a lot of information out online and Google and, you know, the, you, you come in and, you know, we it's, it's helpful for us, especially for me as as a specialist to know what your symptoms are, not what you think you have or what you think is wrong with you. I mean, I, I appreciate you know, you telling me what you think is wrong, but it's also important for me to hear what your symptoms are. So mm -hmm. I think when you go to the doctor, be prepared to tell them what actually is going on with you, not what, not only what you think is going on with you because you read something online. It's very important. A lot, of, you know, we're listening a lot. We're, we're looking at the patient. I know I'm looking at the patient as soon as they walk into the room. Uh, um, you know, so that's part of the exam. As soon as you walk in the room and you start talking, I'm more, my exam's already started before I've even touched you. And so I'm listening to what you're saying, but I want to know what you're feeling, what's going on, what your symptoms are, not I have an ear infection, because that doesn't really help me determine whether you really have an ear infection or not. I need to know, is your ear clogged? Is your ear draining? How long has this been going on? So those are the aspects of you have a limited time with your doctor and I'm one of those guys that you may only have 15 minutes with so I need to know exactly what you're feeling so I can get to the bottom of what's going on with you and I think that's something that we need to relay to patients more and more nowadays because that's one of the things that's frustrating for me as a physician is you know when I'm trying to help someone and we have a limited amount of time in the office visit so excellent I think that was a very important question if I may just add a little bit because I think it is extremely important to choose properly when you choose a primary care physician not only do you look for someone with the qualities and the qualifications and the experience and expertise, but you also remember that this is the person who may refer you to other specialists. So that's going to be a great deal of trust after you start dealing with this patient, with this physician on a frequent basis, because he will then determine who else you see if he decides that he needs the help of specialists. So it's very important to judge that person when you go to see him or her and to achieve good rapport with this person. You will have to rely on them in the future. Mm -hmm. Omar. Omar. Who is that? Dr. Dr. Court. Dr. Court? Yes. Go ahead. Is that you? Yes. Go ahead. Did you have something to say? Yes. I wanted to say thank you guys for letting me know what you guys are looking for when you're trying to judge someone like me. When you come to see thank you so much. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. <laughs> All righty. You know, the thing of it is, is Patrick, you know, add, I'm sometimes, sorry. I was just going to add, sometimes it's good if you're going for, to the doctor for the first time, go along with someone because you, they may help ask, ask questions that you may be having. And they may also hear things that the doctor is relaying to you. If you're under, you may not understand. And that person may be able to explain things to you or hear things um, that you did not hear. Excellent. Excellent. Which, which brings me to an important point that Dr. Fredericks alluded to, if you don't understand, ask the question. It's similar to being in a classroom setting. Uh, you know, the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. And you're not alone. There are other people in that classroom who have that question. You're just courageous enough to raise your hand. Your health is in the balance. So if you're in the room with the doctor and they're using terminology that, that's unclear to you, you have to ask them to break it down. 
they owe that to you. Right, true. Very true. Very. I think that's one of the key aspects of, of all of this discussion. Yeah, definitely understand what's going on with you. Uh, if he prescribes medicine, understand you know, what the medicine is for, how long you should take it, whether there are any side effects, what, you do, what should you do if you have side effects, those type of things must be answered. And you must come out of the doctor's, doctor's office comfortable that you had an appropriate visit. Okay, the, the one thing that Dr. Patrick Anderson brought up was the federally qualified health centers. And there throughout the university, I think uh, President Biden actually brought it up the other day in one of his speeches that there are seven, uh, I think seven, mm -hmm. 700 throughout the, throughout the country. And these qualified health centers, they feature um, primary care doctors, they have infectious disease, they have dental, they have so many, all, and as nutritionists, they have so, so much to offer. Understand that they, they, they will not turn down anyone, even if you can't pay. And, and if you can pay, the, the, depending on, you know, your, your, your income, there is a sliding scale. But even if you cannot pay a dollar, they will not turn you down. So, and I know in the Newark area, Newark Community Health Center is the, the largest one in Essex County. And they have seven, seven sites throughout Essex, Essex County here. If you cannot afford... You, know, you to see, you know, to go to a doctor on a regular visit, then look into the Newark Community Health Center, or if you're outside of the Essex County, look for a federally qualified health center. Thank you for bringing that up, Patrick. Yeah, the, the other piece of it is um, they don't function in isolate. They often collaborate with specialists or with other major healthcare systems so they can right. make appropriate referrals when needed. Right, they do. It's mandated for them to be associated with hospitals as well as specialists, and they will refer you to the appropriate person. Excellent. And, Excellent. and many of them have an integrated care model where they have mental health services on site as well. Yes. yes. True. True. That is true, Dr. Shalom. All right. Thank you very much. Dr. 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 Wallace, before we let you go, we got one more question here. <laughs> uh, there is there is a question from actually a nurse practitioner, and I want to get this one. one of, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 as a nurse practitioner serving in a hospitalist role, I am often called to see patients with nosebleeds. I am often concerned. I know that nosebleeds can be simple or complex. What uh, should I be called when should I call a ENT specialist on consult for a nosebleed? So oh, certainly if, if, if the nosebleed is significant so that, you know, patient is pouring out blood through the nose and the mouth, you know, you're, you're going to have to call the ENT. Um, right. You know, if the, if the nosebleed doesn't stop with simple pressure for, you know, five, 10 minutes, and there's no one that can place a pack, like if you're not comfortable putting a packing within the nose, then you're gonna to have to call the ENT and we're gonna to have to come in and see the patient. So, um, you know, I mean, that's, hopefully your hospital has an otolaryngologist who's, who's on call. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's one of the things that we have to deal with in, in ENT. So, um, yeah, I mean, those, you know, if it's something that is not stopping at the bedside, uh, either by way of packing or pressure, then, then yeah, that's, that's the time to call the, the ENT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, Omar, uh, as a pediatrician, we see nosebleeds all the time. Mm -hmm. It's very important uh, for individuals to know, as Dr. Wallace said before, where the uh, point of bleeding usually occurs, and it's on the heart uh, part of the septum uh, on the inside. And and the uh, the issue with 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 blood and clotting, um, blood doesn't tend to clot if the flow is too brisk, and the and the flow is really brisk from that area. Uh, and so the bleeding is blood that's escaping from the blood vessel. So the, the easiest and the quickest thing to do is just take your finger, take the soft part and push it in towards the center because it's usually bleeding on one side, not on both. Sometimes it can be on both sides, but if it's bleeding on, 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 on the right side, you just take your finger and you press it and press the soft part of the skin towards that and stop the bleeding. That's the pressure that stops the bleeding. And you hold that, that, that for five minutes, even if someone has blood thinners, as we talked earlier, if you stop the bleeding, ultimately the clot will, will, uh, will form. Uh, if you take it and it starts to bleed again, you hold it again, you hold it for a longer period of time. And in general, the clot will form, it will be a soft clot. And what you want that soft clot is to harden to form a little scab. 
Uh, and so that's the important piece. Some people say, well, just hold your head back. Well, holding the head back doesn't do anything except have that blood go to the back and your throat and down. That doesn't stop the bleeding, okay? And, and some say, well, put something cold there. You need to apply pressure. That's the most important thing is to apply pressure to stop the blood flow so that the clot can form. And most of the cases, that will do it. Make sure that after that happens, you don't blow your nose or pick your nose to remove the clot because that'll start again. But that will handle the overwhelming majority of things. And as he said, if you have somebody that continues to bleed after you've done that pressure, stopping the bleeding for you know 10 to 15 minutes, then you need to uh, go to the emergency room. And then if they can't stop it then, then they go. My, my experience, Dr. Wallace, is um, I've not been very successful with, uh, with, with cauteries in general, with the silver nitrate and things like that. It sometimes works, but this is very superficial and it doesn't often work. So that pressure is, is one of the most important things that you can do to stop most nosebleeds. All righty, excellent, excellent. Um, let me see here. This is, uh, and we're almost, fin we're almost out of time. But uh, it says, and, and this, this question is so appropriate. Lastly, it states, <laughs> when, when is it recommended, what is the recommended age for a woman to have a mammogram? All righty. So that, 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 that is an appropriate question to, for us to have our last question. Do, Dr. Anderson or uh, one of our primaries? What about Dr. Salam? Oh, oh, Dr. <laughs> Small as well. well. Dr. Patrick, can you start off with that one for us? Um, Sure. Uh, again, if, if for the um, at-risk population, which is patients who um, 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 have a strong family history or have known genetic predisposition, ideally you want to start earlier than the general population, which should be at around age 35. Um, but you know, as important as a mammogram is the ability to do um, a self-breast um, exam. Um, so we start there as well and um, create that parallel. Um, I think that the, 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 the data suggests that 35 to 40% of women um, actually are the ones who bring their abnormality to, abnormality to attention. Um, but in general, age 40, um, you get the baseline and then um, alternate years um, um, up until I believe the age of 50 and then um, annual after that. Right. Okay. So we, Anderson, so, hey, Anderson and I, we talked about this one time where we begin to see a younger and younger uh, women coming with breast cancer uh, in the 30s, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like you said, some genetic uh, predispositions um, line with this. And I'm sure there's a strong family history, correct, Dr. Anderson? Yes, I mean, there's several known genetic predisposition. And I think the, um, the, the initial um, um, indication is to know the family history. Right. I mean, recently I had a patient with ovarian and breast cancer who referred her young daughter to me for um, contraceptive counseling at 24. And on an exam, she had a breast mass um, that turned out to be um, bilateral breast cancer. Um, so, you know, knowing the family history um, does, uh, and, and that speaks to most cancers, um, mm -hmm. even prostate cancer. When do you start screening? Um, um, knowing the family history, um, and if there's a pattern that warrants um, genetic counseling, we start there. And once you realize that you are part of an at-risk population, then you screen earlier than the general population. Now, while we're still on that, the use of best control pills or other contraceptives um, within that age group or even those who are postmenopausal, what's your take on that? Um, you know, what we do know is- um, cancer. Yeah, with respect to cancer. What we do know is, you know, many of these um, um, hormonal uh, medication does have some chemo protective agents, I, I mean, properties. Um, however, some of the combination ones, and we believe the ones, especially with progestins, um, in the post, especially in the postmenopausal setting, will um, predispose some women to um, breast cancer. But also bear in mind that in many patients, if you give them unopposed um, 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 hormonal support, meaning estrogen without the progestin, you also put them at risk for um, uterine cancer. So again, it depends on the risk. It depends on the, um, um, the factors that you're trying to influence and the ability to um, vigilantly monitor these patients. 
Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Omar, I think that, that uh, one of the things that, that um, we stress is uh, that uh, early um, breast examination. And for um, in the United States, the average age that uh, most girls start to have periods, which means that they've usually developed uh, their breast development, um, is uh, somewhere between 12 and 13. Uh, in African-American um, females, it's, it's maybe a year earlier. And so, uh, but once they start to develop and they start to have menses, they need to be taught how to do a normal breast examination so they'll know what's normal and what's not so they can develop blunts. And as, as Nelson said earlier, you know, it appears that there's an increasing number of uh, younger, especially African-American uh, women developing breast cancers at, at earlier age. And so uh, they're the, the ones that are best able to pick up uh, an abnormality, uh, especially if there's a family history, they should, they should, they should start. But everyone needs to learn how to do the, the, the breast exam when they're uh, uh, at menses, and that means at a fairly young age. And what I said to women um, is, you know, when the, the goal of doing these self exams is to be familiar. So should there be an abnormality, you know, then you recognize that this is not usual. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, we would have little cards that we would give to hang off your showers. But, you know, in, in today, there are several other mediums in which the educational um, materials available. I find even YouTube, you can YouTube anything. Um, but it's also when you establish a relationship with your primary care provider, whether it's a gynecologist, your primary care physician, or your pediatrician, that they, you know, spend the time and teach you how to do these self breast exams. Mm -hmm. Excellent. My last question for Dr. Wallace. Dr. Already. Wallace, <laughs> what is the commonest cause of nosebleed? <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, it's basic. So it's a combination of the weather, yeah. so winter time, nasal dryness, and then deviated septum too as well. So, which is a shift in the septum, uh, abnormality in the septum that can cause some abnormal airflow and cause the septum to dry out. So that, that combination I would say is the most common. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yeah. Olivia, as a med peds person, you've seen more nosebleeds than Dr. Wallace. <laughs> so he only sees a small spectrum of folks that have nosebleeds. <laughs> He sees, he sees a significant yeah, the ones the, the ones I see are the ones that need to be taken care of. Referred from Dr. Zaluya and, 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 and uh, URIs. You know that, Nelson. Yeah, yeah, Dr. No, Wallace, no, what's no, your no, life no, like now no, in no, allergy, no. allergy season? This is allergy season. Yeah. How, yeah. how does that impact you know, the, 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 the business of your, your practice? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, a lot of people come in for nasal congestion. A lot of people come in thinking they have sinusitis, and I'm mm -hmm. sure we can cover that in another visit, um, you know, what the differences are. But, um, you know, a lot of people come in with allergy symptoms that they think are a sinus infection. Uh, yeah, I mean, it gets busy this time of year in particular because of nasal congestion, watery eyes, runny nose, which are, you know, common, you know, seasonal allergy symptoms uh, that patients come in for thinking that they may have a sinus infection. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All righty. Well, uh, thank you everyone for, number one, thank the audience, but thank you physicians for coming on and bestowing your knowledge. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up here. All righty, number one, I'd like to thank OB Healthy for allowing us to bring this platform to you. Remember that you can go on YouTube uh, or, or on our Facebook, OB Healthy, and see the prior uh, videos and webinars. And please, uh, on YouTube, uh, subscribe so we can continue to bring it to you. Uh, remember that this is every second Saturday at one o'clock. We will be here to answer any medical question. Uh, tell friends and family, tell anyone that you feel that uh, could use good medical information. Um, we look forward to getting their questions and answering it. All righty. And please, the most important thing that I can say, and well, anything that we try to educate you with is that please do not change any aspect of your medical care until you consult your physician. Only your, your physician can best treat your medical problems. And until next time, all brothers, thank you for coming on and bestowing your knowledge. Until next time, I'm going to say peace.
Happy right. Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Thanks for having me. That. Uh, All right. Take care, everyone. All right. Take, take care. care. All right. Let's see. Whatever.